Mr. Marlon Starling, thank you very much for coming on to the BossingBar.com, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. And, Champ, first off, you know, where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in Hartford, Connecticut. What was it like being raised out of there? Um, I was raised in the in city. Um, it was just like any any other uh, Afro-American city. You know, we had a, a, you know, predominantly a lot of blacks, but it was mixed. Um, it was, I was a kid just growing up in, in, in the environment that I was in. What were you like as a kid growing up? Um, I was a scary guy. You know, I was a scary guy, but I, but I loved sports. Baseball was my thing. So I loved the Baltimore Orioles and the Cincinnati Reds. That's back in the early 70s. I enjoyed fighting, you know, I enjoyed Muhammad Ali. I mean, should I say Cactus Clay? And then he tried to Muhammad Ali, uh, I um, I was a, I was a good uh, football player for a little while, and uh, I played a uh, football game. You know, I was the cornerback, and the guy um, ran me out. They blew me over, and a friend of mine said to me, "Why don't you come down to gym with me?" And I, you know, I've been there ever since. And going into a sport like boxing, how did your parents or what? How did they take that for you to be going into you know this sport like this? Oh, right, right away when I when I bring the application home in the box, uh, my mom said um, I'm not signing to that. And I, uh, you know, I kept uh, asking and asking, and then um, I started sneaking down to the gym. And I was like eight, nine years old, and I kept going down to the gym and going down to the gym. And you know, it was keeping me out of trouble. So I guess she didn't say nothing. And the first time you went, you walked into a boxing gym, what what uh, attracted you to that? Well, when I first went out, I had a friend of mine who said, uh, hey, why don't you come in the gym? And I said, um, I looked from the outside. I was at the, at the doorway. So I stood there for the next say, two or three months. You know, I, I'll go down to the gym, but as far as I go, is to the front door. And I was just, you know, looking at it. Looking at it and my, my friend said to me, he was a little smaller than me. He said, come on, why don't you box me? And he was, listen, he was a lot smaller than me, so I that was a good deal. I got to do something with a little guy. And um, like I said, the rest is history. It kept going and going. And eventually I, you know, I got into the gym and fought the little tournaments. And then, you know, I had fun and won it. And, you know, uh, if you could remember the first time you sparred, what was it like for you? Did you, you know, were you nervous about it? You know, was was it exciting for you? You know, how did that go? It was, it was exciting. It was, it was exciting because at that time, like I said, Cash is crazy. You know, he was, he was, you know, the best thing out there. I remember the time he was fighting, he was going to fight the Jerry Corey. And, um, you know, I, when I got in the ring, you know, I thought that, you know, I thought I was going to have Or should I say Cassius Clay at that time? And what were the things that you liked about Cassius Clay? I mean, we all know about his, his career and his speed and, and how he was able to, to conquer the, the 1960 Olympics over in Rome. But what attracted you to, to him? What made you like him? Or why was he a standout to you? Because he was a guy that hit and don't get hit. I love a father that hit and don't get hit. And I, I was a father that kept, kept my hands up and talk, talk trash and hit and don't get hit. I mean, I, I thought I, I was young and I thought in the gym was a lot of the older guys. I boxed a lot of the older guys and I was a guy that talked and he couldn't hit me. How was your amateur career? What was that like for you? And do you believe that it's necessary to have a nice amateur career before coming onto the pros? Definitely. I, I, I still, to add that as we speak today, I still say amateurs are a lot harder than the professionals. I mean, that, that sounds, that sounds um, crazy to the people that doesn't know about the sports boxing, but the amateurs was a lot tougher than the pros. And you're right about that. I think a lot of boxers uh, today, even amateurs today, uh, a lot of people, they've lost the fundamental, even pro fighters, they've lost the, the basic fundamentals. And, you know, that's why boxing, I think, isn't like how it used to be. That is that is exactly why. That is exactly why. People want to turn pro. And, and four or five fights, I didn't turn pro until uh, I was my, my amateur record was 97-13. I had over a hundred amateur fights before I decided to turn pro. And the reason why I turned pro, I was gonna quit I was gonna you know, get boxing up. And I said to myself, Well, let me let me tell everybody kept saying, Oh, when are you gonna turn pro? When are you gonna turn pro? I had no I had no 
I gave that that I wanted to turn pro. That wasn't in my my forte. I wasn't thinking about turning pro. But the people kept saying, "Oh, where are you going to turn pro? Where are you going to turn pro?" So I said I was about to quit. And I said, "You know what? Before I get out of this sport, let me see what I can see if I can make some money." I mean, I, I felt like I'd been into it for a long time. Let me see what I can I can make some money. You turn pro. What was that like that first night out there in Hartford, Connecticut, there in your hometown? What was it like on that first fight going in? Were you nervous? Were you excited? Were you scared? What was it like there? Um, you know what? Um, my, my first pro fight was a lot easier than my first amateur fight because, um, you know, like I said, I was a plastic kid, and I, and I love I loved the, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a plastic kid guy. I love the hit and don't get hit. So when when my trainer said, um, you know, okay, you, you want to turn pro, I was working at a gas station at that time, so I felt like this. Um, it's, it's not going to stop me from making my money. My my, my money was working my gas station job. And um, when I decided to turn pro, um, I fought a, a couple of four rounders, and um, I did pretty good. You turned pro in July of 1979, and just six months into your career, uh, about your sixth fight in, you fight this guy named uh, Charles Newell. You defeat him, and, you know, what happened to him afterwards, you know, he passed away from his injuries from that fight. How did, how did that affect you, you know, emotionally during that time? I mean, I'm sure it affected you even until now, but how did that affect you back then? Well, see, um, I, I fought Charlie Newell as an amateur. He was a, he was an inmate from the, uh, from, from the prison. And my coach used to always take a couple guys up to the prison to fight exhibition. And Charlie Lou, me and him, and he was, Charlie Lou was a guy from around the area where I grew up at. And he was a bully, and I was scared of him. But when we fought, I know that in boxing, I was a better boxer. And um, I fought him in the prison, and it was a close fight. And... When I turned pro, my 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 manager said, "Well, you know, you're gonna fight Charlie No, because Charlie No had turned pro, and has inside me, I'm gonna get him now. I'm gonna I'm gonna show him who the boss now. And um, we fought that fight. Um, I think I think it was in um, January, I believe. Uh, it was January, and um, we fought uh, at the Harbor Civic Center, and that was a, like it was like a grudge match." Some of the people uh, up at the prison were saying, uh, oh, Charlie New fought uh, Miles Stalin, and, and that was a close fight. That was a close fight. And I was just amateur. And, and I, I went to this fight. I tried real hard. I went to the fight and said, okay, I'm going to show him now. I want to show him now who the boss. And uh, we fought. I was, I was beating him pretty good. And the seventh round, um, you know, I was, I was, it was taking some punishment. And um, the seventh round, I ended up with a good combination. And they went down. Now, 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 me and Charlie knew we wasn't enemies. There, there, there hasn't been too many fighters that I fought that I was, you know, I really, really didn't like. Now, it happened a couple times in my program, but in this fight, I, I was just fighting for, for the, the neighborhood. You know, who, who the best in the neighborhood? And when I, when I knocked him out, um, that night, um, you know, I said, uh, Charlie knew that didn't you gain consciousness. And so um, that, that night, um, my trainer said, um, you know what you should do? He said, you should take, you know, you should get away from that for a while. Because, the, you know, the people kept saying, you know, he, he, he's unconscious, he's unconscious. So I went I went to Atlanta, Georgia for a few days to, to clear my head and everything. When I, when I was in Atlanta, my, my people were saying, um, you know, oh, this guy, we don't think this guy's going to make it. This guy's going to make it. And eventually he passed away. And um, that, that that really hurt me. That scared, not only did it hurt me, now because I had turned pro. It was only your sixth fight. It was my sixth fight, right. And I was undefeated. Yeah, you were undefeated, correct. He I was, was I believe, three and two. Okay, I was undefeated. And uh, my, my thing was to, to keep winning, to keep winning. So um, after that fight happened, I'm saying to myself, um, this is over, boxing is over for me. I came home. And I went to the school, and his parents came up to me, and they said, you know what, um, we don't want you to stop boxing. They said, um, my, my son, his mother said, my son passed away doing something that he loved to do, so we want you to continue to keep on pursuing your goal. I don't think if they would have told me that, I would have kept on going. 
because that was a boost. That was a help boost my my career because he told me, do what you want to do. My son had fun doing what he wanted to do. And that kept me going back into the sport. I think I fought a guy from Ohio right after that. Did that affect you for the rest of your, your career there? Did you have that in the back of your mind every time you walked out there to the ring after? Um, you know what? I think um, I got to go ahead, not from my parents, not from nobody. I got to go ahead from his parents. His parents told me, don't stop doing what you like to do. And she, when she told me, my son died doing something that he loved to do, and it kept him out of, it kept him out of jail, and it kept him you know, in the, in the limelight. She told me, keep doing what you're doing. And I, you know, I got back into the boxing. Without them telling you that, it probably wouldn't have meant nothing, you know, if anybody else was telling you, but it was his family telling you this. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. That was, that was, a, that was a big boost. That was, a, you know, people don't understand. That was a big boost in my career. It's, 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 you know, don't forget, I was, I was maybe in my 20s, and, and, and they, they said, keep doing what you're doing. And that's right. And after something like that happens to fighters, usually they go they go down afterwards. You only went up, you know. I mean, you had the, the stellar career you had, you know, after something like this. Right, right. It was it was it was a big it was a big um, setback, but it was a, a mental setback. And, and my gym, we had we had a lot of people in my gym that talk junk, and you know, I'm thinking I'm thinking I'm the best shot ready, and um, we were just set to see that. Who we'll pursued the the the, the good of to be the best? The guy that's now considered the best of the best, which is Floyd Mayweather Jr. But you fought his father, Floyd Mayweather Sr. You fought him around your fifteenth fight or so, and this was fifteen fights in just about within a year and a half, two years. So I mean, you know, people don't do that anymore. Exactly, we we fought four or five times a year. I I, I you know we loved to fight. You know, we was the type that um, we had a me and my manager at that time, we had a, a group, and um, it was a good um, get together. You know, when, when I fought, everybody in the city, you know, got together, and um, you know, when everybody went to uh, the civic center. We had a lot of hometown um, people that comes out that came out to the place. What was uh, Floyd Mayweather like? You know, at that time, everybody knew him as a tough guy outside of the ring, but what was he like in the ring there against you? Floyd Mayweather, boy, when I fought Floyd Mayweather the first time, um, Floyd Mayweather was a shit talker. He talked so much shit that day. And um, that didn't do nothing but it, it boost my confidence, and I beat him up. I beat, and, and believe me, Floyd fought a lot like Floyd Mayweather Jr., but he was a little sharp. Uh, Floyd, Floyd Jr. is a little sharper than Floyd Mayweather. See, no, no, Floyd, Floyd Mayweather now, Senior, he was a scrappy guy now. Because when I fought him that first time, right, it was, it was a good fight, but I beat him easily. Did he have pop to his punches? Was he pretty strong? You know, what was he known for at the time? He had, he had a decent jab. But, you know, at, at that at that time uh, in my career, you know, I was telling you, oh, I'm the best in the world. I'm the best in the world. But, you know, I you know, you know as I was priming, right, undefeated. And when when you're undefeated and and you're climbing, a lot of people don't want to, you know, especially the big name fighters. They don't want to rush you through the tanks with somebody like me that had no name, and they they couldn't make a lot of money with. Now don't forget, now my first three fights, my first four or five fights, and I said I didn't make two or three thousand dollars. But but you know I wasn't there for the money. I always felt like this: just keep winning because uh, uh. If you're, if, you're, if you're the best, down the line, they have to pay you. Very true. Um, you win that one by decision, by 10th round decision. After that, you fought about maybe a good seven, eight, nine times, and you were winning most of those by knockout. So, I mean, you obviously had pop to your punches. What do you think were your biggest assets as a fighter? You know, after that, like you said, I had about four or five uh, knockouts. We had the fights in you know, my hometown, mostly in Hartford, Connecticut. And um, you know, I was I was getting better and better, and I was knocking guys out. And then people said, "Oh, I ain't gonna come to the play. I ain't gonna come to the play. He didn't do nothing but knock a guy out. He didn't do nothing but knock a guy out." And then about three or four, three, three or four fights after that, they tell me, "Oh, I ain't gonna come to the play because he don't go the distance. Because he always go the distance." 
So, you know, that, that put my, my mindset is don't worry about the people. Get in the ring and do what you have to do. And in October of 1982, you get in the ring with a well-known undefeated, another undefeated, just like you, fighter named Donald Curry. This was for the NABF and the USBA welterweight titles on the line. What was that fight like to, to fight someone like Donald Curry? That was a fight that would, um, I, been, I was saying that I was the best. You know, I was always saying I'm the best. And then we heard about this guy named Donald Curry. And I fought him, I think, also in Atlanta City. And um, he was a Bob Adams guy. Bob Adams had him at, at that time. Um, and I was, you know, he was undefeated. And a lot of people were talking about how good he was and how good he was that. And they never mentioned nothing about Marlon Stalling. And I fought Donald Curry. And it was a good fight. But I, and, and, but I won the fight. The reason why I thought that I won the fight, the reason why they took the fight, took the fight from me, because I guess I was doing, you know, they, they, they thought that I was playing around a lot. You know, that, that was a that was a fight where I was doing a certain move, and they encountered that the Starling stop. So you you were kind of being flashy in there then. You know, I was kind of being flashy. That was just my way of fighting at the time, and I beat Donald Curry that day. But he had a he had a bigger following, and not only he had a bigger following, he had Bob Allen with him. And he won by split decision, which means one of the judges had it for you, also. Well, you know, like I said, I think that that was a that was a fixed fight. I think I won that fight. Such people with the Bob Allen, I believe they gave him that decision. Do you, do you think the styles had something to do with it? You know, do, do you think maybe they thought of you as a boxer and him as a slugger, and maybe they the judges chose him uh, for his style? I, I, I think I think um, that fight was taken from me because I was doing a lot of showboating. I was waving at Ray Leonard. I was doing some moves where it was my moves. People thought that that was um, showboating, and it was unheard of at the time too. Probably not too many people did that. Exactly, but but you know, and, and and no one said nothing about Macho Camacho and, and Ray Leonard. But since my fight was, I mean, during, during, you know, during that during that era, Miles Salem was on network television more than any other fighter in the world, and he wasn't a champion. You fight a few more fights after that, about six fights, and then you get a rematch with him. How do you remember the rematch with Donald Curry? That was a fight where. Um, I felt like uh, I bullied him the first fight, and I won the fight. I knew I knew it was gonna be a good fight, and um, he did a lot of running in the first fight. So I I felt like I had to um, I had to chase him, right? And you know uh, the reason why Donald Curry beat me that second fight because Donald Curry was stronger than me. I mean I hit Donald Curry with some good shots in that fight, and now if I had hit him with those same shots. In the in the in the first fight, I would have got him out of there. But when I hit him with those shots in the in the um, that second fight, Donald Curry was strong. He was a strong fighter, and he was a good fighter. No question about it. Uh, out of my whole career, I can say that that was one of the best fighters I fought because he did he did he did some of the things that I did. He did he did nothing great. He did nothing great, but he did everything good. And in that, in that first fight, like I said, you guys fought for the NABF and the USBA uh, welterweight titles. This time, you were fighting for the actual world titles, uh, which was the WBA and the IBF. And now you're going 15 rounds. And that's another thing. Not a lot of people, you know, today would be able to go 15 rounds, you know? And, you know, that, that, that fight, um, since, you know, I was walking around saying that I'm the best, I'm the best, I got in that fight and said, you know what? This guy better than me. But then I said, no, this guy's not better than me. This guy had a better day than I did. And that's all it was. And by me beating that straight, I felt like this. That fight hurt Donald Curry. Because after he he beat a strong model of Stalin, he felt like he can fight all the other heavy guys. And I told him, I said, Donald, you can't be fighting these heavy guys. You got to box these guys. The next fight up, you fight our first world champion here of my county, uh, Lupe Aquino, and you fought him in 84. What do you remember about that fight with Lupe Aquino? I had no problem with Lupe. You know, I remember now, I was, I was talking about being the best, so nobody, I had no problems with Lupe Aquino. And you know what, you know what, that's a nice guy. Very good guy, very good guy. Through the years of Long Facebook, 
I've learned to I, I learned to say that Lupe Aquino is my friend. What was Lupe like in the ring? What was his style like? Um, he was a, he was a slapper. He, he didn't put a lot. He didn't, he didn't put a lot lot with his punches, but uh, he kept coming in two, three, four dollar combinations. But you know, when he fought me, I think she was a little over his head. A few fights up after that, you fight the rematch with Floyd Mayweather Sr. Uh, did you see yeah. a difference in the first fight and the second fight, the second time you fought Mayweather? Yeah, I wanted to beat him up. <laughs> and, and, and I did because, you know, this was a guy, you see how Floyd is, but Floyd Mayweather talked so much crap. I mean, he talked so much crap. In that second fight, I beat him up. I mean, they, they could have stopped that fight at any time. What did you think of his brother, uh, Roger Mayweather, during that time? I like Roger. I, I like him. You know, I like Roger as a person. I was I was never crazy about him as a fighter. But, you know, I like Roger. Out of, uh, at that time, I, out of all of them, Roger was. Uh, and, and I like him and Jeff. You know Jeff, right? Yeah, Jeff Mayweather, yes. Yeah. You know, the, the, the baddest ones in that group, I hate to say it like this, was the Floyds. I'm talking about disrespectful. Come on, you know, listen, we we get in there, we have fun, we fight, and we get out. I don't, I'm not going to talk about your mother and this and that. These guys get taken to uh, a different level. That's why I, the, the second fight with, with Floyd Mayweather, I beat him up bad. Another guy you beat up was uh, a few fights up. You fought Simon Brown, who had who was a good fighter in his own respect. I mean, he, he, he was undefeated at the time. He was 21-0. and 0. You know, you took him on and gave him his first loss. You know, what did you think of that fight there against Simon Brown? Beat him up also. I beat him up. And then, then don't forget now, you, you, a good fight where a lot of people were overlooking was Tommy Ayers. Right, that's true, yes. I mean, and, and now, listen now, at that time, you got to think now, all these guys, it's undefeated. Right, and there were the guys that they were trying to bring up, thinking that they were going to be the next breed of, of, of great fighters. And, and they were, but... But you stopped them there. So they, so they send them to me. Why they send them to me? Why did they send them to Ray Leonard and Tommy Hearns? Yeah, that's true. You never got your fight with uh, Ray Leonard or Tommy Hearns. And I, and I tried to get those fights. Oh, I, I, was, I thought um, Leonard was getting ready for um, uh, Hearns in Vegas. And I, I, flew up, I flew up to Vegas to train with, with, with Tommy Hearns. And I beat him up. I mean, we we had a good spa session, and I got the better of that spa session. Every since after that, I knew that I was going to fight uh, Milk McCarry. And a, a few fights up from uh, the Simon Brown fight, you fight a, guy, a tough guy by the name of Johnny Bumpus. What do you remember about that fight? Um, Johnny Bumpus, they, he quit and won. He only had a round to go. Um, Lou Duber took his slinger and opened that cut up so wide. They had to stop the fight, and they said he was up, he was ahead on points. Well, was that was that a big setback for you when that when all that happened? You think, or you know what I say that and that fight? What I say in that fight was they had a better team than I did. That's why they won that fight. My my guys was an experience to, to the Bob Adams and the Don King at that time. We were just sitting there for boxing, and and, and Don King, Bob Adam, and you know that fight. Um, they, they went to the corner. They opened this guy's eye up wider, and then they stopped the fight, and he was ahead on points. He only had a while to go because he was stumbling up after that round. You fight a few fights after that and win most of them by early knockout, and then you fight a guy named Mark Breland, who everybody knows was a 84 Olympian gold medalist and all, considered one of the best amateur fighters of all time. What was that fight like? Another undefeated guy coming at you, a young undefeated guy that tried to blow up Mark Breland. What was that fight like over in South Carolina? They thought that that was the next coming of God. That was the next coming of Sugar Ray Leonard. Because I think Leonard had, had, had uh, I think that thing that read their stuff around that time or something. And um, they put him this guy up. I had, I had a different promoter at that time. I had um, kind of Cedric Kushner. They said, um, you want to fight Mark Green for the title? And, um, okay, I said, okay, we'll, 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 I'll fight him, but we got to make it a 15-round fight. And I fought him. And I knew, I knew that this guy, I, I fought all the, all the good guys out there. I knew this guy 
wasn't hard. I, I knew that he wasn't, um, he didn't fight the people that fought. He never, he never went past a certain amount of rounds. And I was, you know, when I looked, when I looked at it, I said to myself, you know what? I can be right there if it can't be this guy. And you had it all the, on the line there. I mean, you had this undefeated guy, like you said, they were really trying to push and, and bring up 18-0 and 0 for the WBA world title. Now you got your chance at goal, too. Was a lot of that added pressure for that region, or did it only fuel the fire more? Um, anytime you have a, uh, a championship belt online, that's pressure. Because I was, a, I was the type of fighter, I don't want to fight for the world championship. I want to win the championship. Back then, people were happy to fight for the title. I don't care what, how much money. I want to win. You know, think about it. Once you become a world champion for the rest of your life, you know, people go, I'll call you. What's up, Cap? When I fought my brother, we won the fight in South Carolina. South Carolina never had a real boxing fight. They won a lot of big rules. And that was me to really get that fight. I had to had to take some of the, some, some of their rules, but you know one thing I didn't know I knew it was going to be a fifteen round fight, and I said to myself, if I'm behind after twelve, I got to gamble. I don't like to gamble, but I knew that I had to go get it, and that's right. I wouldn't took it from him. I knew that this guy he didn't he didn't fight the fighters I fought. He didn't have he didn't have enough experience. I had my knockouts that he had fights. At that time, and one thing about this guy, this guy had a jab that hurt like most guys' right hands. My brother had a jab. I swear, he broke my nose in the second round with that with that jab. Well, and a lot of people thought he probably didn't have pop to his punches, you know, for whatever reason. But you know, obviously, I guess he did. Well, I tell you what, he got my attention. You beat him, and it didn't even take the 15 rounds. You could have beat him in a 12-round fight because you beat him in 11. What was it like, you know, what, what was that last round like in that 11th round where you knocked him out? Oh, uh, that last round was, uh, uh, like, on the 5th and 6th round, I shot pain to the body, and I could hear him. <laughs> and I said, come on, Mark, come on, man, help me again. Come on, Mark. I was talking to him. I said, come on, Mark, come on, Mark. And, uh, that uh, I think it was the 11th round, uh, and he had me on the ropes, right, and I hit him with a good hook to the body. When I hit him with that hook to the body, he backed up. And when I seen the look in his face, I just went on, I, I went after him. And I, and I kept throwing punches. And then he bent his head down, and I threw, a, I threw an uppercut. And the uppercut missed, and it came right back, it came right back in, into that hook, in that hook. And from there on, I cried all the way home. You finally get your dream and, and win that world title that you've been striving for. Every fighter has their own story and, and their own thoughts of what they were thinking when the ring announcer announces, you know, that they're the new world champion. What was it like for you? What were your thoughts? Honestly, I, I felt like uh, uh, it's over. I'm, I'm ready to give it up. I'll do it. My career you, is over. You feel like like you passed that finish line then. I got the put out. I went the finish line. I did. How many? I mean, like I told you, when, when you get that title, world champion, you made it. And, and not only did I got the title, world champion, I beat everybody out there. The only one I didn't beat was um, Donald Curry. That was the world champion. And you know what? I lost to Donald Curry on February fourth, nineteen eighty four, for the championship. A uh, year after I beat. Breathing, February 4th, 1989, I knocked out Lord Hardigan for the championship. That's right, you did. Five years to the day. Five years to the day. Would you believe it? And you know, you know, I went up to, I went up to Atlanta City to watch uh, Don Curry fight for uh, Hardigan. And you know what? I didn't, I, I ended up not even going. And, you know, me and Don Curry was, I was all right. We talked here and there, right? And I always said, Donald, I'll get him back for you. Just let me fight him. I'll get him back. <laughs> remember now, remember now, that was the United States today too now. Back then when you won this world title here against Bart Breland, it was a big thing because it's not like nowadays where there's so many titles that somebody just rolls their eyes and say, oh, he's a champion too. Sure, there was, you know, WBC and IBF also, but not like today where everybody has a title where it doesn't even matter anymore, you know? 
you know what that 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 when I when I when I fought um uh, my prelim, sure that was a big A championship. But you know what that didn't tell me that I was the best. The reason why they didn't tell me that I was the best because Lloyd Hunter was still out there talking shit, and I said I can't wait to fight Lloyd Hunter again. And I said when I fight Lloyd, I said when I fight Lloyd, Lloyd Hunter again, I'm gonna make him quit. What was your second fight like against Mark Breland? You fought him, you know, not even a year later. You fought him in a rematch and got a draw with him there in Las Vegas. What was that rematch like against Mark Breland? That was, that was painful. Because they were doing everything they can do to, make, to keep that title to Breland. And I beat him easily. And you were one of the highlights of his career. I mean, he kind of went down from, you know, after his first loss, he kind of didn't, you know, go anywhere with that after, you know, uh, so, so in a way, that hurt him a lot too. Your his first loss. No, but you know what? Uh, if you look at back on the guys that I fought, right after they fought me, they didn't do too good. That's true. You kind of broke. You kind of shattered their confidence there. I think. I mean, a lot of guys. The the the, the, the uh, Tommy Ears. Uh, Tommy, you you never mentioned Tommy Ears, but Tommy Ears was a pretty good fighter. He was a very good fighter, tough fighter. But you know what happened? They let a young Tommy Ears. Fight a seasoned professional and Mario Stanley. And I know another fight that was read that I'm sure you don't like to hear about was that fight with uh, Tomas Molinares. There was a very that was a very controversial fight. No, I, I'm not gonna say that. I'm not gonna. The only reason why, you know, to me, I'm gonna tell you something. That was one of my best fights. You know that. And when I want to, when I want to, when I want to watch a good fight. That was one of my best fights. That was my last fight under contact with my promoters. Great performance by you. It was, like you said, one of your best ones. I think that was one of my best fights. The only, the only thing I had was the ending come out good. What, what did you think of that outcome and that whole fight in general? What, what, what are your thoughts about that? You know, out of everything, um, I'm going to tell you, to be honest with you, I didn't know. Because the, the, the last thing I remember was the bell ringing. Then the next thing I remember was leaving my hotel room, getting get ready to get on the plane. So everything in between that, as my mother really left, I don't remember. And what, why do you think that is? I mean, what, why don't you remember any of that? I mean, you know what? Believe it or not, those four or five hours out of my life, I, I don't want Hey, guess what? God made... I bet if you cut you and cut me, I bet it comes out red. God made the human body. I don't know why. But I know from when that bell rang, the next thing I remember was leaving my hotel room, getting on the plane. And then I went to the hospital. Now that's some scary stuff. Yeah, that, that's very scary. I mean, that's uh, that usually takes a toll on you, like, in the long run. Because even, like, today I forget things and this and that. Well, you know what, I, I you know people that are that's because of Boston. You know what, I didn't get hit a lot. The one thing about me, I wasn't the guy that took, I, I didn't take a punch for too many people. I mean, my, to me, the worst, excuse my, my language, the worst ass was I took was when I won the title for Mark Wheeler. You know, I mean, I mean and, and I can tell you, that first fight with Mark Wheeler, I got, I got hit with everything but the kitchen sink. Wow. And the next fight after Molinaris, uh, you fought Lloyd Hunnigan, the fight we were talking about a bit ago. Uh, what do you what do you remember again? This uh, you know news they were going to fight uh, Lloyd Hunnigan, a guy that you know has this big reputation of being this this badass. Uh, he was a WBC world champion. What did that feel like to fight him? Oh man, I was so I was so no, I was so geared up for this guy because this guy was talking a lot of shit, and this fight was this fight was for the world championship. When I mean by the world championship, this wasn't for the BC or the BA or something like that. This is for the best fighter in the world. The the the, the one who won this fight was the best welterweight on the planet. And what was he like in the ring there? What what was that fight like? I tell you what, when, when we came to the, when we came to the middle of the ring for the fight, I, I looked at him and said, "We're here now." And I seen a look on his face like, what the hell did I get myself into? <laughs> and uh, you had a Hall of Fame referee there for that day, Bill Slane. He was a referee there for for that particular fight. It was a it was a big fight, man. It was, it was a really big fight. I remember watching this. And you know what? You know what? Um, I told my 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 assistant trainer. I said, you know what? 
by the middle of the fight, I'm gonna make that guy quit. And and my guy says, my guy says, oh, I'm gonna, he said, I don't know, who, I don't know if you're gonna, uh, you're gonna make him quit, but the referee gonna have to stop it. And you know, by the middle of the fight, I said, you know what, he don't wanna be my friend. And if you watch that fight, by the middle of the fight, he was every round after the, after the guard really, every fight, every round, he started putting his hands out to shake my hand. <laughs> I, I wanted I wanted to eat him. He got his respect. Oh, to the utmost. And and, and you know what? I was kind of I I I kind of felt sorry for him. Now you don't supposed to feel sorry. You don't supposed to feel sorry for somebody that you you fighting. But you know what? By the middle of the rounds, I felt sorry for him. But you know what? He brought all that on his own. When you go up to a big fight like this, you know, this one was in Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas, which was, you know, the place to be back then. You know, when, when you're walking in the ring there for these big fights like this one especially, you know, what, what, what are your feelings? I mean, what are you thinking when you're, you know, making your way up the steps there to go in the ring? You know, what, what, do you, what usually came to your mind? Did you just kind of, like, filter everything out and just focus on your fight, or were you nervous, or how did that go for you? The, the, the idea is, believe it or not, the, the idea is... See if you can close your eyes in a dressing room, right? And when you open your eyes, you're in the ring. Because you hate that walk. I don't care no fighter in the world. If any fighter in the world, they say they like they walk, they tell you a lie. You wish you can, from the dressing room, and clap your hands and be in the ring. I always hated that walk. I just want to get in the ring. Once you're in a ring, again, like in a big fight like this, and the bell rings, you know, for that first uh, round, that opening bell. Does every does all the nerves kind of go away, or does it like not go away until the first punches are thrown? How does that go? The, the nerves go away is when you touch each other. My my idea was just to throw it, throw it, get to a clinch or touch each other. After that is go to work. Don't get careless. Bring your head. Everything from from training goes into effect after you make contact. Like we said, that fight with Hunnigan was uh, February 4th, 1989. Uh, in mid-September, you fight Young Kill Chung there in Hartford, Connecticut. You you beat him by a 12th round decision. Second to none, Michael Nunn. Uh, you fight him there in Las Vegas in another big fight. You know, everybody knows who Michael Nunn was. He was considered to be a great fast, you know, fighter, you know, great jabber. What was that like fighting Michael Nunn in Vegas that day? Um, that was a fight which I went up two weight classes. And you know what? He was talking about Michael Nunn like he was the second coming of God. And and I said to myself, I can beat this guy easy. But you know what happened? I after the first round, because Michael Nunn, Michael Nunn, he likes to hit he likes to hit up the bell. And I told him in the press conference, okay, I said, you know what? If you hit me after the bell, it's gonna be a fight. So I said that in the in the press conference. Right? And um I thought that if I were to win the championship, you got to go get it. Because everybody's going to give you the title. You got to go get it. And with, with, with Michael Nunn, I, I fought that fight just to show him that I can, I can stay in the ring with anybody instead of going to get it. And that fight was a close decision. I should, you know, I should have won that fight. This was your first fight at middleweight. He was undefeated, 34-0. and Like you said, big name, Michael Nunn. Everybody knew who he was. He was going to be the the next coming, you know, and uh, you did pretty good against him, you know. You you got a he got a majority decision win over you, but I mean that was pretty close from someone that was just fighting welterweight the fight before. Exactly, and, and you know, I was trying to keep my weight up there, to try to be. I want to be around one fifty five, fifty six, fifty seven, right? Uh, and I as we getting closer to the fight, closer to the fight, my weight started coming down more and more. Wow, and uh, again, I mean, that was one of the guys, one of the judges, he, he had it at 114-114 uh, and had it to draw. That's, that shows that, you know, you did all right. Oh, you know, you don't, you don't get no, no brownie points for being all right. <laughs> you get brownie points for winning. Yeah, true that, true that. Uh, Maurice Blocker, you know, you fight him a, a few months up. What was that fight like against someone like Maurice Blocker? Uh, it was good, but it was scary. The reason why it was scary was I just went up there to fight the, the guy for the middleweight title. And I, I couldn't make the weight. Maurice Blocker beat me because I couldn't make the weight. He beat me He beat me in the ring. I felt like uh, 
I wanted to fight. But, you know, I was so weak in that fight. I, I passed out in training camp. And that was your, your last fight, champ. What happened there? Why, why did you decide to, to say, this is it, that this is where I, the farthest I go? You know, what made you decide to throw it in there? Okay, because uh, um, after that fight, um, this is not my people saying, uh, let's fight the decision, let's fight the decision, right? And I was mad. I was mad. So then I said, forget about it. So, so then I, um, I took off eight months. Uh, and then I went to California to see if I wanted to fight again, right? And I boxed this young guy, right? I, I held my heart and everything, right? But after I got out of the ring, right, I slept for two days. Right then and there, told me, your career is over. Because everything hurt. Do you still feel a lot of those pains from, you know, your boxing career? Do you do you go through a lot of those pains, you know, nowadays? Uh, pain, do I go through a lot? You know what? I, got, I go through pains of uh, getting old. Um, if you ask me, do I put them, do I connect them to boxing? Who knows? You know, uh, uh, boxing's been good to me. I go, you know what? I've been good to boxing. I, I, I respect the sport of boxing. I won't get, I'm sure, I'm sure, um, uh, I could have came back and made some more money, but I never wanted to, I, I never wanted to be nobody's opponent. I'm in there to win all the time. Not some of the time, all of the time. Yeah, you did that, champ. And there's been fighters like uh, Pauli Malinaji and Antonio Tarver who had that name, the Magic Man, the nickname. And, you know, you were before them. How did you get that nickname, the Magic Man? I was only one Magic Man, you know, a Magic Man. That was Miles Allen. Because, you know what? People say that Miles Allen wasn't a big puncher. Uh, it was a defensive fighter. I won half of my fights by knockouts. And early knockouts, too. And, and guess what? They got knocked out from something. Something knocked them out. <laughs> Very true. And a lot of fighters from your from your time, you know, they don't really care for boxing anymore. They don't really watch it as much. You know, they might watch big fights here and there and stuff, but they don't watch it as much. Or, or do you still keep up with the sport? And how do you feel about the sport nowadays? Um, no, I don't. I don't keep up with the sport. I I'm not like everybody else. I know about um, who, who. I'm in the gym a lot because I do personal training. Believe me, believe me. If nothing else I do know, I know boxing. I know the sport of boxing. And a lot of these guys that fight today, they wouldn't do nothing. In, they, they couldn't do nothing in the, in, the, in the year of the 80s. The year of the 80s, we had, we had class. We knew, we knew how to fight. And you had real competition, too. Yeah, we had competition, we had class, and we knew how to fight. You see some of these guys. I, I seen that. Remember the guy, Al Jarrell? You know the guy, uh, Al Jarrell, that was undefeated? When I first seen him fight, and he's undefeated, 27 minutes, I said, these guys can't fight. I love these guys. Like, 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 um, Broner. Broner talk a lot of junk. I mean, a lot of these guys. We didn't do nothing in the 80s. But once again, you can't compare the 80s. You can't, you can't compare the eras. These guys do not have the fundamentals that we had in the 80s. Yeah, they were basic fundamentals, and they don't even have that nowadays. I, I, you're right. Back then, you wanted to go to the smelliest, dirtiest gyms to work out. And nowadays, exactly. uh, nowadays, a fighter goes in, and they want the best technology, the cleanest gyms, and all that, or else they say, ooh, that's dirty, I don't want to train there. You know, they're prima donnas now. They're prima donnas. They don't want to go in the gym with a wild They want to go in the gym with, the wild they the gym with the, We were in the gym with some roaches. <laughs> so we were in the gym with roaches and the some bags. And what do you think of this uh, 15 round thing, how it went down to 12 rounds? Do you think boxing would be a lot different to have 15 rounds? Would it be better, or is it a good thing that they brought it down to 12? You know, you know what they say, 12 to 15, separate the men from the boys. And that's why you wanted to fight Breland in 15, too. <laughs> hey, 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 12 to 15, separate the men from the boys. And, and to all your, your fans, uh, champ. You know, I'm sure you've made up all the all the fans. You brought a, a lot of great memories to the sport, especially during the '80s era, which it, a lot of us talk about in my post and my posting and stuff like that. We talk about the '80s and stuff. You know, you brought a lot of joy to us. How do you want to be remembered to what I call the three big F's: your family, your friends, your fans. 
How does Marlon Starling want to be remembered? Uh, a guy that knows boxing, a guy that loves to fight, and a guy that was real smart and respectful to everybody. And champ, you always have been with me, respectful. You're a real champ in and out of the ring to me. And, you know, I appreciate your time in doing this and uh, coming on to theboxingbar.com to do this interview. And I appreciate it very much. Hey, man, the pleasure is mine, man. Anytime you, anytime you give me a call.